morning. Good morning. Good morning. And welcome to worship on this, the 18th Sunday after Pentecost. If you've not met me, I'm Pastor Dan Sire. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here this morning, and I thank you for being here as well. And those of us, or those of you who are worshiping at home, welcome to you as well. As you'll notice, we have a bunch of quilts out here today, and at the end of the worship service, we'll be blessing those quilts. And Kartika told me that there was the, the group of quilters had created 375 quilts. That's pretty amazing. That is pretty amazing. So it's a beautiful day. The rain has stopped. The sun is shining. The colors are out. And we're here to be in the presence of our Lord to worship and share together. Just a couple of things. If you're taking communion with the cups, the little individual cups, and you want to do that this morning, you can. If you want to do that and you don't have one, raise your hand. We'll make sure the usher gets you one. Anybody? Okay. Second thing is that today, in lieu of the Apostles' Creed, will be, we'll be, if you so desire, joining together in the words of Pastor Dan's statement of faith. We've used it here before. And just as fair warning, we'll probably use it again a few times, maybe before the end of the year. So uh, take a look at it beforehand if you haven't seen it. Or you can, instead of listening to me in the sermon, you can read it during that time so you don't fall asleep. But because uh, we, 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 we say it together, but you might not believe what I've written. So you want to make sure that you take, check it out beforehand and make sure it's something you want to expressed together. And if you have genuine concerns about it, then please let me know. Again, let me know, because again, I plan on using it a couple times. And it's not heretical. It, I think it, it, it fits in with uh, Lutheran theology. When I created it many, many years ago at St. John, I called it a creed. And one of my parishioners, Lynn Markford by name, God rest her soul, uh, said, you know, the creed was developed by, you know, the fathers of the church centuries ago. I don't know if you can claim this thing as a creed. And I said, then you're absolutely right. So we call it a statement of faith. So with that, I think I've hammered long enough. I invite you to please stand as you are able as we join together in confession and forgiveness as it is printed in your worship book. Blessed be God, the one who forms us. Jesus who bears the cross, the Spirit who makes our joy complete. Amen. Amen. Let us bow before God in humility, confessing our sin. Steadfast and faithful God, you have revealed the ways of justice, yet we fail to follow you. We are overwhelmed by the world's violence and suffering. We are afraid to risk what we have for the sake of others, for the harm we have caused, known and unknown. Forgive us for the unjust demands we place on others and your creation. Forgive us for the ways we turn away from you and our neighbor. Forgive us. Lead us back to you and set us on the right path. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Beloved in Christ, God's justice stretches beyond all understanding. God's compassion is beyond compare. In Jesus, God is always making a new way for us. In Christ, you are already and always forgiven. Amen. Amen. You may be seated because I'm lazy in my old age and I like to sit by. We'll continue our worship with the Kyrie, and I warned her because she's going to help me out because I've never sung this one before. So we'll see how this goes. We'll join together in the responsive singing of the Kyrie, which you'll find on page 98 in your red hymn.
Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. God of love, giver of life, you know our frailties and failings. Give us your grace to overcome them. Keep us from those things that harm us, and guide us in the way of salvation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And we continue our worship with the reading of God's Word. First reading from Ezekiel. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, this proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine and the life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is, is it not your ways that are unfair? When the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity, they shall die for it. For the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do what is lawful and right, they shall save their life, because they considered and turn away from all the transgressions that they had committed, but shall surely live, they shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, the way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your aggressions, otherwise iniquity will, turn, will, will be your room. Cast away from all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of anyone, says the Lord God. Turn, then, and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Make my joy complete. 
be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility. Regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the, let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not re regard inequality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being formed in human form. Um, in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have obeyed me, not only in my presence, but not much more now in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to do work for his good pleasure. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. and the elders in today's Bible story want to know of Jesus, by what authority are you doing these things? And despite his deft deferral of the question, which Jesus does quite a bit of, I think we all know the answer. Jesus was doing what he was doing by the authority of God. And what was he doing? Well, prior to this particular verse in the story of Matthew, Jesus had chased the money changers from the temple. He was healing the sick, the lame, and the blind. 
He was doing these things under the authority of God. So what does that mean? Well, I submit to you for the sake of this morning's discussion, let's define God's authority as the spiritual motivation to do the right thing. Again, I'm suggesting you to, to you this morning that God's authority is the spiritual motivation to do the right thing. Therefore, in this story, Jesus was acting out of his spiritual motivation to do the right thing. But how about you? By what authority are you doing these things? By what authority are you doing the things that you do? What influences your actions? Possibly your genetic makeup, which I guess in many ways you can't escape. escape. Maybe your family and your friends, maybe your fears, maybe the size of your bank account, maybe you are influenced by the opinions of your favorite 24-7 news channel, and by the way, the one you watch is the good one, those other people don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> or maybe you are motivated, as we all are to some degree, by the original sin, and I believe it is the original sin, by the original sin of obsessive self centeredness So what motivates you in what you do and what you think and what you say? Probably all of the above and then some, and that's not bad. However, it's not necessarily good either, but I think it's the reality of our lives. Yet a serious question I think remains, which I'm going to pose to you right now, and that is who or what should be the foundational influence of your actions? And I submit to you that based on today's theme in the Bible text, that God's authority, that the spiritual motivation to do the right thing should be the, in, the foundational influence of of your actions. And as Christians, we should seek to understand and act upon God's spiritual motivation to do the right thing through understanding and acting upon the message of Jesus. That's why we're called Christians. And so what might God's authority in Jesus look like? If you decided to give Jesus as much credence as you do your family relationships, your bank account, and your cultural banner waving, what would that look like? Well, maybe it would look like honestly seeking to come to terms with the fact that you are worthwhile and that you matter, which might manifest itself in you taking better care of yourself or generally trying at least to make good decisions for yourself and your life. Maybe God's authority in Jesus means sometimes being confrontational as Jesus was with the money changers in the temple. Now I'm not speaking of going off on some rant in response to the unfounded opinion of your favorite talking head. No, I'm talking about having the courage to genuinely do the right thing when doing the right thing may not be popular. Maybe God's authority in Jesus means comforting the ill and the misfortunate, not in response to your cloying need to feel good about yourself, but rather in genuine response to genuine need. Maybe God's authority in Jesus simply means doing what you say you will do. Just like the story of the two brothers in today's gospel text. So, by what authority are you doing the things that you do? We all have a lot of influences competing for our attention and our actions. But I ask you if you're allowing room for the spiritual motivation of God in Jesus Christ to guide you in trying to do the right thing. 
When I think of doing the right thing, I think as I was putting this together, I thought of my father. He was a good man. Now he was far from a perfect man. But he was a good man. He was not warm and fuzzy. As a matter of fact, I don't ever recall having been hugged by my father. He was definitely not effusive with praise. He had a temper. He spent way too much time working. He seldom went to church, even though his wife, my mother, was there along with all of her four boys every Sunday. But he took care of his family. And he was honest. And I think he genuinely cared for me. He was a good man. And I think we found a clue, maybe just a clue, to this behavior upon his death when we were looking through his wallet and found this very well-worn card upon which was printed Footprints in the Sand. You may have seen that before which goes, one night I dreamed I was walking along the beach with the Lord. Scenes from my life flash across the sky. In each, I noticed footprints in the sand. Sometimes there were two sets of footprints. Other times there was only one. During the low periods of my life, I could see only one set of footprints. So I said, you promised me, Lord, that you would walk with me always. Why, when I have needed you most, have you not been there for me? The Lord replied, The times when you have seen only one set of footprints, my child, is when I carry you. This card, this thought, was out of character for who I thought my father was, but maybe in some sort of quiet way. God's authority in Jesus Christ was a motivating influence for my father. A story comes to mind. We lived in town, in Billings, Montana. My father worked full-time for the Bureau of Land Management, but we had a 640-acre wheat farm 20 miles east of town on a high plateau, one square mile with one tree. And I could see for hundreds, literally hundreds of miles. So I still get a little claustrophobic in this neck of the woods. But anyway, as a family, we spent a lot of time out there, and I had two older brothers, one younger brother, so my father had a ready-made work phase, of course, as soon as we got old enough, which is the case, obviously, on most farms. And I recall I was about 10 years old. My older brothers were old enough to be driving truck and tractor, but I was still relegated to the pickup. And in this case, it was, I think, a 1961 yellow international pickup. And it had dual headlights, but the headlights were on top of each other rather than side by side. I remember this pickup. And it wasn't very old, it had to have been fairly new. And I was able to drive the pickup around the farmyard. Now, it was, of course, a standard transmission, and I really couldn't reach the pedals by sitting on the seat, so I kind of stood and sat at the same time with my butt on the edge of the seat, shifting and driving, and I was getting pretty good at it, but I got, after a while, I got bored of just driving this pickup around the farmyard, so I started begging my dad and bugging him about, hey, can I go out on the county road? So there was a gravel county road, went straight for like five miles right next to our farm. He said, no, 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 you're not ready yet. So I was content to continue driving around the farmyard as I sat and squat and stood driving this international pickup around. And, but I kept bugging him. And then one day he finally relented. He said, okay, take it out on the county road, but don't go more than a mile and don't go too fast. I said, okay. So I got it out on the county road and I remember my little 10-year-old brain the one thing I wanted to do was to go 50 miles an hour, for whatever reason. I wanted to go 50 miles an hour. So we had, I, off I went, and in the back, uh, in the bed of the pickup, was our faithful German Shepherd dog, Paul, who loved to ride in the pickup. That would soon change, but... <laughs> so off we went down the county road and I started picking up speed and started picking up speed and it had recently rained so there were some pretty good sized puddles 
and I was trying to avoid them, but I, as I was picking up speed and picking up speed, I hit one of those puddles, puddles and the rear end started to slide out a little bit, and I got scared, and I kind of froze. And again, I'm kind of sitting and standing, and I stood right on that accelerator. So off we went, going down the county road, swerving from one side to the other like this, and, and there were ditches, borrow pits we called them, on either side of, of the county road. Not real deep, but I don't know four or five feet deep, and so we're going down the road, going down the road, and then off we went into the ditch, and I remember bang, 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 and finally I had presence of mind to stop, and stop the pickup, turn it off, I opened the door, got out, and Paula jumped out of the pickup, and we're both looking at the pickup and looking at each other going, what the heck happened? <laughs> And so I kind of looked at the pickup, and it didn't look too damaged, except for the fact that both fenders were bowed out from having smashed on either side of this ditch. And there was a barbed wire fence which had scraped the top of the cab, so it had barbed wire scratches along it. And I thought, oh my God, now what am I supposed to do? So Paul and I walked back to the farmstead. And all the time I'm trying to think, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? You know, you're 10 years old, you just maybe destroyed your father's brand new pickup. Oh my God. So I'm thinking to myself, I'll say, I'll pay for it. I'll pay for it. For whatever reason, that was kind of like the 50 mile an hour deal. You know, that, that's all I could come up with was, I'll pay for it. I had no idea what I was going to use to pay for it. But. So, got back to the farm, and I remember they were eating lunch, so I went in there, and I'm not sure how I broached the news, but I did, and I followed that confession with, I'll pay for it. And he just got it, yeah, sure. So uh, we got the tractor, got a tow chain, and off we went going down the county road, and I helped him hook a chain to the front of the pickup, and we pulled the pickup out of the ditch, and I sat in the pickup to steer as we pulled the pickup back to the farmyard, and uh, got back in the farmyard, and I'm still, he hasn't said much, I'm still waiting for whatever's going to come to, to come. And he unhooked it and uh, got in it. He, I had, for whatever reason, I had the keys in my hand. He took the keys from me, got in the pickup and drove it around the farmyard, came back, got out of the pickup, handed the keys to me and said, well, you better try it again. And I did. And I will always remember my father's response, my father's actions in that situation. The chief priests and the elders in today's Bible story want to know of Jesus. By what authority are you doing these things? The same can and should be asked of us. Yes, we have a lot of competing influences in our lives. But I wonder, are you allowing room for the spiritual motivation of God in Jesus Christ to influence your actions? How do you honestly respond when people look at you and look at your life and wonder, by what authority are you doing these things? Amen. Any questions? Nobody ever has. Well, with that then, let's continue by singing the hymn of the day, which is printed in your worship book. <coughs>
seated as we declare our faith together in the statement of faith as printed in your worship folders. I believe in God, the source of all life, wholeness, and love. I believe that God is revealed in Jesus Christ. I believe that in his life, Jesus reveals God in grace, mercy, forgiveness, and justice. I believe that in his death, Jesus reveals God's determined presence in the world, even in the face of hatred, violence, and pain. I believe that in his resurrection, Jesus reveals God's calling us to abundant life, both now and forever, life beyond our fearful and fragile imaginations. I believe that God lives among us, within us, and through us by the power of the Holy Spirit. I believe that God moves us to be together in communities of faith, hope, and love. I believe these things not out of certainty, but out of faith, as one who trusts in the reality of God, revealed in Jesus Christ through the Holy Spirit. Amen. Now I invite you to please stand as you are able as we continue our worship service with the prayers of intercession. trust in you as we pray for the church. Give bishops, pastors, deacons, and teachers of the gift, the gifts of wisdom and discernment. Be with them in bold truth and faithful witness. Merciful God, receive all our prayer. Lead us in your truth as we pray for creation. Empower us to look to the interests of others as we make choices that impact the environment. Summon us to be advocates for healthy waterways, habitats, and air. Merciful God, we see in our prayer. Lead us in justice as we pray for those in government, the military, and other positions of authority. Give them humble and willing hearts, looking to the needs of others. We pray also for our enemies. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Trusting your goodness, we pray for all caregivers and people who are sick or suffering in any way. Especially today, we lift up Joanne, Anne, Chris, Erica and family, Jared, Laura, Jennifer, Chris, the Fallman family, Jim, Nikki, Kay, Joy, Brooke, Nancy, Peggy, Michael and family, Barry, Mary, and Mel. Give them encouragement and consolation in your presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Teach us your paths as we pray for this congregation. Be at work in us and unite us in your love as we labor together for the sake of the gospel. Merciful God, receive our prayer. We give thanks for all the saints who died secure in the knowledge of their salvation. Keep us fearless in our faith and certain of your resurrection. 
Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these prayers and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. Continue our worship with the offering of our gifts and tithes.
us pray. God of power, God of plenty, all things belong to you. We bring your gifts to the table that all might be fed. Form us into the body of your beloved Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right our duty and our joy that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life. And so, with all the choirs of angels and the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. saying, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The Lord's Supper is prepared, and all are welcome. Please be seated. For those of you who are communing at home, and those of you communing here in the congregation with the individual meals, I invite you to prepare whatever you're using for bread. And then take and eat the body of Christ given for you. Take that which you're using for wine and then take and drink the blood of Christ shed for you. For the remainder of us will commune continuously beginning on this side. You just look more responsive this morning. There's <laughs> the little sleepy eye over here. So I just invite you as you come forward, because I don't know who's taking the elements and who's not, but if you're accepting the elements, extend your hands, otherwise keep them at your side to receive a blessing. We do have gluten-free wafers, so if you request that, no one has yet, but don't feel bad if you want that. Just let me know and I'll get you a gluten-free wafer. So uh, I'll have the bread and... MJ. MJ? MJ will have the wine or the grape juice in the little cups, and you can put your empty cup in the tray as you return to your seat. So again, with that, the Lord's Supper is prepared, and all are welcome. Let's see. Let's try
Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you. The body of Christ given for you.
body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. We pray. Blessed be your name, O God, for we have feasted on your word, Christ Jesus, the joy and delight of our hearts. Strengthened by this food, send us to gather the world to your banquet, for none are left out and all are satisfied. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. So as I mentioned at the outset, obviously we're going to honor and bless the quilts today. We'll honor the people who made them and bless the quilts themselves, 375. That's quite an achievement. And of course, these are meant to, uh, to comfort and keep warm those people who may be living in discomfort and cold. So they do serve a very useful purpose. So today we will first bless the quilts with a responsive blessing, which you will find in your worship folders. And then I ask you, as it says here, put your hand, let's see, put your hand on the nearest quilt. I'll do that too. Let's see how I can do this. Put your hand on the nearest quilt. I think that'll stay there. We gather today in the name of our compassionate Savior to give thanks for members in our congregation who use their willing hands to give comfort and life's necessities to those in need. To, to you, you, merciful Lord, Lord we, we give thanks for all the faithful, faithful people, people who alone in their homes or in small groups cut and sew together a couple of scraps of fabric to form tops of spectacular patterns and hues. We ask your blessings for these quilters as they create their labors of love. We thank you for the quilters and ask you to bind our hearts in love for the people who these quilts were comforting in times of stress. We now dedicate this rainbow of quilts to your glory and ask that you shower blessings upon those who receive them, that they may use them for warmth, shelter, luggage, and the many different ways of sustaining lives. Lord, Lord teach us also to use our talents to reach out to the world as these quilters do. Bless the work of the quilters and Lutheran world relief. For to you, O Lord, is the glory forever and ever Amen. Amen. And now I understand that there is special recognition for the quilters. So whoever's doing that, come forward so we can recognize your quilters. So as Jenny is coming forward and getting um, their gifts, if the quilters can come forward as well, don't be shy. How many, how many boxes or bags do you have? Uh, we have 11, I think. 11. So we need 11 people. Hopefully you're all here this morning. Come forward to receive recognition and a special gift from your congregation and appreciation for the work that you do. So as they are coming forward, I'm going to embarrass them a little bit and tell a little bit about them. Um, just so you know, these quilters don't just come here and make quilts. They truly care for our congregation. They care for each other. Um, they fundraised for our tractor, for our, um, what else, bridge, yeah. right, a little bit. Um, so these ladies do a lot, and they make really good desserts, too. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you, quilters. And I can see that there are, <laughs> I can see that there are three ladies, Peg, Pam, and Denise, who are unable to be here this morning, so we appreciate them as well. Why is always any guys, Phil? <laughs> we offer. 
Did you offer? Yeah, we Are did. they welcome? Would you let them in? Sure. <laughs> All they have to do is you, tie you a knot. say that now. <laughs> 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 Why not? <laughs> so, so, so you guys keep that in mind that you're welcome. So once again, let's recognize these ladies and what they have done. this year was 392 last year and Jill still wants to make 400 <laughs> <laughs>
one thing, um, we're going to pack the quilt right um, with boxing it and then moving it to the trailer, correct? Yeah, right after church. So if you are sitting near a quilt, just bring that particular quilt out. We'll have a procedure on how to pack it, I'm sure. I think that's it. than in December, and we're hoping to have some baskets for the raffle. We'd like to have them by October 15th, so that the actual bazaar is November 11th. So we need some time for people to look at the baskets and decide if they want to buy tickets and if they want to be involved with it. And we also want to encourage people, it's soup and it's baked goods for the bazaar, and we have other people that come in with crafts, so they purchase the tables. We're hoping, and I'm hoping, it's not really all the ladies because nobody voted on anything. I'm hoping that we can use the money we raised to finish, do a refinish on the floor in the fellowship hall. Because the floor hasn't been waxed for years, I don't think. And it's looking rough, and I think we need to protect it. So that's it. Wait, wait. Wait, wait. Wait, wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. wait, wait, wait. With the bazaar, our book sale comes and covers. It's also going to do our fundraiser at the same time. And I want to thank some people who have already brought books. And you can put them across the hall from uh, Kartika and Angie's office. And don't just think of your books. There's people who are downsizing, family, friends, anything that isn't a technical journal, we'd love to offer it. And the books we don't sell go to the library or Yankees or the jail. Okay, one more. And there will be adult, a short adult class after we finish packing the, the quilts. So. Please come, I have a short lesson. Thank you, anything else? <coughs> Saturday Christ, Good Shepherd Will. Yeah. Yeah.